I'm Brent Stafford and this is RegWatch by RegulatorWatch.com. Social license. It's a term we frequently hear in public discussion around the regulatory approval process for large development projects such as pipelines, LNG plants and mining operations. But what is it? What does social license mean? Well, it's a relatively new term. Corporate executives and environmental activists around the world can thank a Canadian, Jim Cooney, for coining it back in 1997. The full term is Social License to Operate, or SLO. It evolved from the mining industry and speaks to a form of permission granted by a local community for a company to undertake a local project. This all sounds so very nice, but Social License presents some immense challenges. Traditionally, development projects in Canada underwent two clearly defined processes of licensing. The first being the legal process in which regulators evaluated if a project could be built safely. The other is the political process in which our elected officials decide if a project should be built. With social license now added to the mix, things get nebulous as there is no formal process, agreement or document involved in achieving a social license. Complicating matters, the social license model has inflated to include opinions from those outside of a project's local community. Indeed, opposition from activists halfway around the world could conceivably block a local project from moving ahead. Joining us today by phone is Dr. Roger Gibbons, a retired 30-year professor of political science at the University of Calgary and senior fellow at the Canada West Foundation, which for over 40 years has been conducting nonpartisan economic and public policy research on issues important to Western Canadians. Dr. Gibbons, what was the original intent behind social license? Social license at the front end simply meant that resource development had to have identifiable community developments or community benefits. So, for example, if a pulp mill is being built in, in Prince George, uh, social license meant that the city had to recognize that there were benefits that came to them beyond simply salaries and wages and, and profits, but that the, the community itself benefited in some way. And when you think of a very specific development, like a pulp mill or a mine or something like that, it, it kind of makes sense, you know, that this development should have a positive impact on the community. And the community is then on board for that development because it sees a real benefit back to the community. Kind of, kind of makes sense. Dr. Gibbons, what are the challenges around social license? Social license has become so difficult to operationalize in, in, in any way because it's not conferred on a, on, a, on a company. It's not something you can hang on your wall and say, yes, we, you know, we now have permission to go. There's no physical license and there's no social acceptability in terms of who gets to confer social license. So who then is responsible for granting a social license to operate? No one owns social license, right? No one has the ability to confer social license in an un unambiguous way. And so the consequence, it's always up, always up for grabs. And groups who do not uh, accept a, a development, who may even live outside the province or even outside the country, but are opposed to a development, can still claim that they are withholding social license. Dr. Gibbons, how has the process changed in regards to, say, the way government and regulators work? We used to have more difference towards government or towards um, institutions like the National Energy Board who would convey social license by the granting the approval for a particular project. Right? That's what governments did. They, they supposedly looked at the pros and cons, they looked at the impact on communities and they said yes or no. But social license sort of shifts that debate into, into a much more amorphous swamp of opinion. And there's no way of sort of drawing that debate to a close, putting a line under it and saying, okay, social license is now being conferred. It's, it's, it's messy, it's acrimonious, and at times it becomes very personal and very nasty. And I think it's fair to say that we've seen some of that nastiness around the pipeline debate, which presents the NEB a challenge. Activists want climate change to be considered in the regulatory process, but it's not in the NEB's mandate to do so. Regulators are, are 
good at one thing and, and bad at another thing. If they, if they look at a pipeline, they can make a decision that this pipeline can be built safely if these conditions are met. I mean, that's basically what they, what they do. Or they can say, no, it can't be developed in a safe and environmentally sound way. But the decision about can be made or can be built is very different from the question of should be built. That's really a political question. That's a, decision, a question that goes back to governments. And it's not something that regulators can adjudicate. But environmental groups, for example, are much more concerned about the should question than they are about the can question. Because they can look at a particular project and say, well, yes, we could do that, but we shouldn't do it because it contributes to a long-term dependency on, on hydrocarbons. That's a kind of, kind of issue that the regulators simply can't handle. And so we're left, we're left in, a, in a void, in a sense. And it's, it's become a very difficult situation. Well, that's it for this edition of Reg Watch. Before you head off, please like us on Facebook and don't forget to follow us on Twitter. For RegulatorWatch.com, I'm Brent Stafford.